everyone, my name is Brittany and this is The Berg, a tech and leadership podcast series by the Seidenberg School of Computer Science and Information Systems. So today we have a very special guest, Miss Julie Gill, the owner of Roche Ballet, a company that teaches ballet to adults. Um, Julie has taken the time out of her day to sit with us and share some of her experiences. So Julie, thank you so much for being here with us today. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Okay, so um, I kind of wanted to start off with um, basically your history with ballet, because I believe you kind of started later on in life. Could you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I actually didn't start um, any form of dance, um, much less ballet, until I was uh, almost graduated from high school. I decided to get started with ballet and pretty much just fell in love with it from the first class, but it was long and winding to get where I am now, but I didn't start until later in life. So that is why I have a very soft spot in my heart for other people who wanted to start uh, beyond the typical like three years old <laughs> when, when uh, it's sort of societally expected that you would start ballet, although I don't believe you need to start there, but that's when I started was at 17, which in the grand scheme of things is super young, but in terms of ballet is a uh, uh, later, definitely on later on the spectrum. Yeah. And I'm guessing that kind of served as inspiration. I mean, that I feel like that kind of just served as like the whole inspiration for Rose Ballet, just like your own experience, because I feel like, like you said, you know, there are people who kind of start off ballet at like, like you said, three and um, it's like that experience is a lot different than like you know 17 so I can see like where those two overlap um so even before you did ballet and before broche ballet was a thing were you ever interested in being an entrepreneur or was that something that you only ever considered once you started ballet I actually didn't even I I I, I did think that I wanted to be some sort of entrepreneur at some point. I don't think I knew exactly what that meant or what that entailed, but I do think I had an inkling for starting something or creating some sort of change in the world. But entrepreneuring relating to ballet was just about the last thing that I ever thought would be possible. So there was um, ballet itself definitely didn't spark any entrepreneurial ideas until much, much later. But, um, so like based off of that though, like when you say it didn't really like ballet and entrepreneurship didn't really overlap. Like when would you say that you started kind of like thinking in that context? Um, really not until I started what I started now. And even then a little ways into it um, because I was da- only dancing and my teacher decided to take me on as sort of an apprentice. Um, she, um, she got injured she slipped on the stairs and broke her back during one of our lessons actually and couldn't teach um so she took me on as an apprentice and kind of taught me how to teach and gave me all of her students and at that point it was like still a side thing I was still working full-time and was just teaching nights and weekends um and then when I moved away from New York City I almost just stopped entirely but then decided to continue try to continue with private teaching and then one thing led to the next and it was like oh, I kind of have a business on my hands. I guess I should (laughs) Um, take some more time for this. So it sort of, it really uh, blossomed over time through different opportunities kind of coming up. Okay. So like in terms of creating your company, how was it getting started? Um, Because I just kind of feel like, you know, that's just like a, like you said, it kind of, I guess the opportunity kind of happened like over time, but I could imagine that trying to kind of piece like that whole concept together and like getting it like off the ground. Like, how was it like that experience for you? It was, um, it, I mean, in some ways it was natural because of the way it unfolded, but in other ways it was extraordinarily difficult. Um, it was difficult in that, you know, I was still working full time. So I had basically a full time job at a startup, which is a lot of work and a lot of hours, and then was putting the company together on on my spare time. So it was definitely a lot of work because I was working for that company pretty much 5 a.m. to 2 or 3 p.m. and then would teach for the studio from 3 to 9 and then just do that just, you know, every day and work all weekend and all that stuff. So in that sense, it was extraordinarily difficult in the way that it happened because it was on the side and kind of cropped up. Um, And 
<laughs> the de definitely the scariest moment was actually signing my first lease. I remember that very, very clearly. Um, that was a really, really scary moment. I think the only reason I did that was because I had my job and I, I could cover the lease with my job, with my, with my, um, with my pay. So it was a little bit like lower stakes, but that was, that moment was like extraordinarily terrifying when it was like, oh my God, I'm actually signing a commercial lease. This is like, this is the real deal. This is crazy. Oh, I feel like, okay, um, since you're kind of trying to do the both of them at the same time, like when was like the point where you kind of just knew that that was something that could actually like sustain you and you can just like focus on that? Yeah, it, it was a, definitely a difficult decision to make. That was a very difficult choice to make because my, my whole life, obviously I went to the Seidenberg school, right? I went to study computer science. The whole thing was going into computer science. I was a product manager at that point in time and had like a career, right? So you're going from a very stable, very sought after career to like the deep end of a ballet business, which has a very different kind of uh, what you would expect as a monetary outcome, right? No one's excited. No one's going into the ballet business thinking they're going to hit it rich, right? But if you're in software development, right, that already kind of has like a certain kind of expectation for it. So it was a really difficult decision and, and really required me to actually decide to like let that part of my life go um, and like let that career go. And so I think I waited longer well, in some ways I didn't wait long enough, but in other ways, I think I waited longer because I wasn't ready to let that go. And I wasn't sure, like there was a serious fork in the road that I was staring at. Like, am I going to keep going with this career or like, am I going to go into the dance industry and just completely go a different direction with all of this? So that was a very challenging choice to make. Um, I did not wait until I could live off of the business though. That would have been so much work <laughs> that I couldn't do both. I pretty much only waited until I felt like there was enough enthusiasm and excitement and momentum and interest that it would continue picking up to get where I wanted it to go. Um, and combine that with not being able to keep up with all the work um, and feeling like I wasn't doing well enough at either thing. Like I wasn't able to focus hundred percent at my job and I wasn't able to focus hundred percent at the studio. So it was like, I have to pick and I can't pick my job. I can't, <laughs> this, this other thing is, has my heart. So I had to pick it. And so it was, it was a, it was a, it was a tough time for sure. I feel like that I, I feel like in that moment, I guess it's just like, I think something that you said that was really important is just kind of like feeling in your gut, like um whichever one like fulfills you the most. And I think that it's really nice that you were able to kind of just like, you know, feel that out and just trust that like whatever happened happened and that was the right choice and obviously it seems like it was definitely the right choice um but you mentioned that you were a Seidenberg student um do you or could you kind of explain like how some of the skills that you learned as like um I'm not sure if you if you majored in like CS IT like whichever um was this yeah yeah. Computer science. Okay. Yeah. So, um, could you kind of just explain how, like, the skills that you learned from that kind of transferred over into like this new like job that you're doing? Totally. I mean, a hundred percent. They a hundred percent transferred over in every, in every possible way, and 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 in any unexpected way. I mean, the ability to think critically through problems relating to data is extraordinarily important for running a business. I mean. The spreadsheets alone that I've created to keep track of all of this stuff have not only made it possible to run as complex of a business as I do, but also saved a lot of money from not having to bring someone on to do it or buy expensive software to do it. It's like, no, I know how to make a spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet is my database and you know, you can, you, you have the knowledge for it. Um, making websites uh, incredibly important, especially when it comes to making it actually how you want. Like it's one thing to use Squarespace, but it's another thing to use Squarespace and know how to code. Cause then you can put in widgets that do things and you can make it so much more interactive because you know about that kind of thing. Um, and now I'm developing uh, my own software for the studio so that it can take people's attendance and have like a smart um, recommendation system for videos that will work for their their needs and where they are and their skill levels and so obviously being able to build that software wouldn't be happening without um, without the computer science degree so I feel like I mean every single day since I started the business I've used it in some in some way shape or form where I see other entrepreneurs who don't have that background struggling with these same things that 
don't feel as difficult because I, because I was trained in it because that was the, that was the, where the, where the training lied. I think that's kind of like one of the really nice things about computer science. It's like, um, one of those things where like it always, you can always kind of like find a way to try and apply it to something. And I think that, you know, I think that because of that, it's just very, just like very versatile, but also in terms of like, you already having that background um, with that, like, what are some skills that you would, or what are some skills that you had to learn? Like, you know, I mean, you already had that background, but like, I'm assuming that there are also like some things that you had to like learn along the way. So like, what are some skills you had to kind of like figure out on your own? Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, there were so many skills to figure out as well. Um, I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest things to learn was sales and marketing where, um, sales would be like sending emails to people, telling them about your services, being able to make it compelling, clear writing, following up with them on a timely basis, you know, trying to sell what you're put, put out into the world and get people to buy what you're trying to sell. Because in the beginning, the saying build it and they will come is totally not true and nobody comes and you have to go out and find them and you have to go fight for them and you have to know is it your selling tactic or is it your product that's the issue why aren't they buying it and so having having sales ability would be a huge skill that I had to learn I did have a little bit of it from a job I had right out of college at Mathnasium working in sales for them but I wish I had paid more attention. I wish I had worked, <laughs> um, paid more attention to those things at that time because that was the hugely valuable skill. Um, and then marketing, like everything from how to create visuals that look nice on a website, right? It's one thing to code the website, but it's another thing to make it look nice and make it so that someone can read it clearly and hit a one button to buy something at the end and create a really nice, concise funnel that gets them from finding you to that end point setting up ads, um, running social media campaigns. These are all things that I've had to um, pick, up along, pick up along the way. I mean, other stuff like accounting and bookkeeping and you know, stuff, stuff like that is, is other little stuff. But those, that was a huge area of skills, just like communication around getting people to want to buy what you're selling. That was a huge deal. So I know you said you kind of had like, um, like that little background, like that little sales background. When you say you picked it up along the way, like, did you have to kind of, or did you kind of like explore some courses or did you like really like go out of your way to teach yourself all of that, like on your own? Like, like how, how is it that you kind of like picked up? Like, did you also, oh, um, also like, did you ever kind of like talk to people who like already had like that knowledge and then they kind of just like helped, you know, share like their wisdom with you in that sense? Or could you kind of like elaborate on that a little bit? A lot of it was just doing it, honestly. Um, a little bit of research, you know, Googling things here and there, um, trying to understand. But uh, as far as like getting, you know, specific mentorship for more experienced people, that is definitely really difficult because to approach a busy person and say, can you just help me with like what the basics of sales are? They're very unlikely to want to basically give you a crash course that you can find on the internet. So it's unlikely to find someone who's going to give you really specific information um, who's more experienced and just happens to like want to tell you everything you need to know about it, um, especially because once you have it, it's hard to even remember all the things you learned about it because it just sort of becomes ingrained. So a lot of it was just like trial and error. You know, someone didn't um, sign up. Why might that be? Next time I'll try this, that, the other thing, you know, kind of listening to what they said back to you and taking a different action from there. So sales and marketing is actually really um, a good place to experiment in that you can get their feedback and they'll say, well, it's too expensive. And then you say, well, did they really mean it was too expensive? Or did they mean I didn't position it correctly? Or did they mean that they don't care about it? And then you can kind of start to try different things and test different things with different people and see what what starts to work. Um, so yeah, it really, really mostly a combination of like looking things up on YouTube and Google and trying, trying it, testing it on people, testing it on the customers. I think that's kind of like a good approach because um, I think that when you test things, it, it sticks better. So you kind of like, okay, well, I'll try this. It doesn't really work. So then you try something else and it's like, okay, this works. So just kind of like having that 
process go on I feel like it helps it kind of just like stick in your mind way better than just like reading it and never like implementing it um but like when you got started or or since you've like started it for a while now um what are some things that you wish you knew prior to starting well I guess all of anything can be picked up along the way right anything you don't know can be picked up um so I think as far as like a specific like life lesson I wish I would have learned beforehand is you know when you're when you're running a business and when you're trying all this stuff out on your own it can all like it's 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 hard to explain it can all feel really personal like you're putting your idea out there you're putting your vision of the world out there into the world and when you're starting out it's like really scary and i feel like when i was starting out that i heard from business people and they always seemed like super serious and like talking about numbers and business plans and spreadsheets and i always felt like the anxiety that i felt at the beginning was not normal and like that i should be a more hardened business person and not feel all of those things but ultimately when you're creating a business i think it's like you're putting out a piece of art into the world of course it's scary of course it's of course it hurts when people say they don't like it or when they say negative things to you of course that's all part of the process and i think i wish i would have known that that was going to be a part of it and that it's just like super normal to feel nervous to put yourself out there and then for it to sting in the beginning when you get rejected and that these are all like a natural human things like business people say it's not personal it's just business but it feels really personal in the beginning and that's okay. That's okay. It should, it should, you're an entrepreneur, you're putting your vision and your life out into the world. And it's okay for that to be a little raw in the beginning and to be sad when people cancel or quit and to feel scared and nervous that it won't work out. That's all just like actually a really normal part of being an entrepreneur. I wish, I wish I had known a little bit more about that. And I feel like a lot of people would just like really appreciate that sentiment. Um, but also I feel like, I guess, in a way, I mean, since you're saying like you wish you kind of knew knew that um, in the beginning, I I guess that's like that was kind of one of the challenges that you kind of face, like just coming to terms with that. And um, in regard to like challenges, like what's kind of one of the biggest challenges you've faced, um, like recently in terms of your business. Well, definitely COVID has been a huge problem um, slash challenge because I'm at the point of all of the lockdowns and shutdowns. I was running three in-person studios. I had three separate commercial leases that I was running and I had a team of 15 people. And so to close all of that down and still owe all of that money was incredibly, incredibly challenging. Um, ultimately, we could only keep up with that for about three months. And then I decided to close all of those studios permanently and lay off my whole team and move in a completely different direction with the company because that was just not possible to continue on with that, um, with all of that. So that was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, now that that's like a, almost a year in the rear view mirror, about nine months, um, it was about nine months ago that all that happened. Where I am now is an incredible direction and I'm able to reach so many more people than in the past because it's 100% online and I'm able to reach people all over the place. But at the time last June, that was a really, really, um, extraordinarily stressful and uh, terrible time in my life. I wouldn't go back there. I'm happy I'm here. I'm happy of all the lessons that I learned, but that was really, really tough. Yeah, I feel like, I think that it's it's kind of unfortunate to say in a way, it's like the pandemic is obviously like super devastating, but also like in the context of like your business, it kind of helped it venture into like a different realm. And I guess like for me, what I kind of want to know is like how has your approach especially you know earlier we we're kind of talking about like branding and things of that sort like how has your approach to that changed since it's now like you know strictly online like is it kind of the same is it kind of different like how do you go about that so it's interesting because um way back from the beginning of the studio i always had this idea that i would expand nationwide that i would either franchise or open my own studios i've always wanted it to be bigger than just denver which is where i opened it and so from the very beginning i had started a youtube channel and an instagram page and started putting myself out there teaching since like the very beginning of the studio um, actually about six or eight months in i think when i started that because i always had this idea of expansion and i was like well 
you know, it maybe in, maybe in 10 years when I'm ready to expand, I'll have an audience on YouTube and I'll be able to pull them and see where to go next. And maybe my next opening will be easier. So that was kind of why I had started to create an online brand earlier in the business. Um, it didn't really benefit me in Denver. It was really only for this like pipe dream in the future of being able to expand um, to other places. But luckily, <laughs> having already had a brand when COVID hit made that not quite as terrible of a transition, right? Because I wasn't also building a brand at the same time as I was pivoting. I already had a brand. People already knew me. People already knew my face. They already knew my company. They already knew my studio. And so there were actually people who were excited to take class with me because the opportunity came up due to COVID. Um, so that was very lucky in that regard. And now I have, like, let's say in the past, I would have spent maybe an hour a week on YouTube and maybe an hour, maybe three to five hours a week on Instagram and marketing on there. And now it's like maybe half my life is spent on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and marketing and communicating with, with people online, because that's, that's how I, that's how I make my connections. Now that's how I make my relationships. That's like, you know, I am my own brand now. I'm no longer a team. I'm it. I'm, I'm the brand now. So I've kind of gone a little bit more, like take a lot more time and effort into the branding aspect of it into putting out my philosophy and not just like, I mean, it became a more urgent pipe dream, let's say <laughs> in the, in the past, it was like a 10 years down the road thing, but then it really became the lifeblood of the company now. Yeah. It's like now is the time. It's kind of like you, you, you kind of like prepared yourself before you even knew what was yeah. going to happen. <laughs> Basically um, I was ready for this moment. I didn't want it to happen this way, but wait, I was ready for this moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but like, um, with your company being online, I would like to kind of know how does that benefit you personally and also just like your clients, like what benefits do you think it being online like has now? So I think, um, I think for me, it has, well, it has a lot less stress. There's a lot less stress in this, in this business because I don't have to pay rent. I don't have to pay, um, uh, teachers to teach in these spaces and those bills really like seriously add up. And when you're running a business with a very high expense and very high overhead, you can't really pivot. You can't really change your mind because you still owe a ton of money at the end of every month, actually at the beginning of every month, really, but you still owe a ton of money no matter what. So you kind of are a little bit boxed in with what you can do you can change and what you can experiment with because because you need to pay the bills you can't you can't take a big hit or a big drop but now I have a lot more flexibility in what I want to try I don't I'm not so worried about taking a risk because if I lost half my revenue or half my customers with a change like obviously it would be devastating but I'm not I'm not going to be in debt the first month that it happens so there's a lot less stress and anxiety on my perspective um, and a lot more freedom in terms of being able to try different things and you know, reach different people and just experiment a little bit more, which I think is key when you're in a new market or in a new place. Um, for the dancers, I think there's a uh, huge benefits. I think there's, um, I'm able to serve people who live in like rural towns and who don't have ballet near them or who a huge market I have is people who want to go on point and a lot of studios don't offer point work for adults, but I do. So no matter where they live, they all have access to that now. And I think the biggest thing access wise is that I have two new age groups. I have people who are more elderly, who um, maybe don't want to go and would be too intimidated to walk into a class of 30 year olds, all successfully, you know, spinning and twirling around the room and feel a little bit more comfortable at home. And then I also have for the first time ever, people who are between the ages of 30 and 45 with kids. I've never had people with kids be able to make it to class in person, but now half my screens have kids in them, right? Because people are all people are at home. They're able to actually do what they want to do with their kids. They're able to actually continue ballet training at home with their kids. And they don't have to put that part of their life on hold while they have the kids. So I think that's really, really powerful. Yeah. I feel like that also just kind of makes it, it just makes it very um, accessible, which I really like about the idea. And it's just like, again, so interesting how it, everything just kind of led into this because like when I'm getting, I'm like assuming when you started off, even though you were considering expanding, it wasn't, I don't think you really meant for it to be just like this whole online presence, but it just kind of ended up that way. And, and like, it was, I guess like a happy accident. I don't know. Like it was just kind yeah. of like one of those situations where you didn't really like plan exactly for it, but it just kind of like came together. Um, it just came together quite nicely. Um, 
And also, I kind of just wanted to ask, um, like, as of now, are you the only um, instructor or, okay, you are. So like, in terms of that, right, if you're, um, or as your com um, company like starts to grow, like, will you ever kind of like consider changing that to kind of just like meet, you know, like, I guess you would say like the needs of like your clients, like, okay, you have like this like influx and mm -hmm. you kind of like start to see that you need to kind of just like let other people kind of like come in and like help you in that way like would you ever consider that um like what's your plan for like further expansion it's a great question it's one i think about a lot right now and um i i don't know i don't know the answer to that question i think that I am still understanding and learning why people come to me. Do they come to me because of me specifically? Do they come to me because of characteristics that I could train into another person? Do they come to me because I offer the best, like the cheapest service? Do they come to me because I have good sound internet and no one else does on Zoom? I mean, I don't, I'm still understanding what they're coming to me for. And I think they're coming to me for, um, things that would be really difficult to get from another teacher. So the way I see it now, as of now, most likely expansion is going to come from, not from other teachers, that I would be remain the sole teacher, but expansion would come from um, interesting ways to meet up with people to have a week-long ballet vacation or the software that I mentioned that I was building to recommend classes that I've already taught. So I have over a thousand in my on-demand library right now of classes and then this engine will help them pick the classes and give them basically a curriculum to follow. And that's a you know a subscription service product that doesn't require more of me. Um, I might hire an admin person to help me with the back end, but I don't, I don't foresee at the moment that I would hire another teacher unless it was like I wanted yoga in the studio or unless I wanted, you know, a, uh, some other personal trainer type something or some other field or aspect, but I don't think I would bring on another ballet teacher. Okay. Um, but also, I'm also just kind of like trying to understand like the format of your classes, because I think it's a really nice idea. Um, so when you have classes, are they, because you kind of mentioned like having like, um, you said kind of like a subscription-ish type thing. Um, but as of now, is it not like that or is it just like a live session? Is yeah, it's a subscription. Live? Yeah, yeah. It's a subscription already now. And so, mm -hmm. you know, growing the subscription base doesn't require another one of me, is what I was saying. Yeah, so okay. it's already a subscription to the classes and they can pick if they want to see me live or if they want only the recordings okay. afterwards. Yeah. Okay, okay. Just wanted to kind of figure that part out. Um, so as the owner of your own company, right? How do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of things? Because I feel like everything is just always changing. And again, because your your company is obviously like based solely online. So you kind of have to like adapt with it. Like, how are you kind of like staying on top of things? Like, um, how are you doing all of that? I think being connected but like it's convenient that my marketing is also how I'm learning. So marketing is that I'm being on social media all the time. I mean, I, when I get my screen time report from Apple at the end of the week, I'm on my phone nine, 10 hours a day, and that's not even counting the time on my computer. So I'm on, on Instagram, on social media, on Facebook, reading, interacting, and being, being a part of the community every single day, all, almost all the day, almost the whole day. Um, and so that's also where I'm hearing about what other people are doing in their classes, what new classes are launching, you know, what's, who's got what service, what's going on here, what's going on there. I think that's a huge, I think that's a huge part of it. Um, and then once you start putting stuff out there that you're interested in, people start sending you stuff that they think you would enjoy seeing. So like people will send me workshops that are happening that I didn't hear about because they think I would be interested in hearing about it. So then you've got all these people who know what you're interested in sending you stuff to help you kind of keep on top of it and keep up to date. Um, I think it would be valuable to have more ways to have community, but all of it takes time. All relationships you're building take time and it's always difficult to prioritize more things and in, in, in a busy day. So I think right now staying connected online is pretty much how I do it, but it's a, it's a constant. It's a, it's a, it's a always staying connected, always looking, always reading, always checking in with people and seeing what's going on. And I would kind of assume also like just hearing like, you know, what people who are like taking your class, like have to say, and that kind of just helps guide you in terms of like where you should go, where you shouldn't like that type of thing as well. 
Um, also, I feel as though um, for, let's say for even future on entrepreneurs um, who are kind of trying to figure out like where their, um, like their passion lies, how do you think that they should kind of just like approach, you know, deciding? Because like how you were telling me earlier, you were kind of like doing this and then you were like doing that and then you had to like kind of come up with that decision. It's like, what kind of tips would you have in terms of deciding like what, what their like, I guess you would say passion project should be and like how to make a career and make a living off of that? I think it takes, I think it takes, listening to yourself and what you find interesting because what you find interesting is not accidental what you find interesting is what your passion will be I mean I found ballet so interesting every time I had spare time or spare money I was spending it all on ballet and my whole life I was too afraid to say that ballet was my passion because it seemed silly or it seemed like I couldn't make anything of it or it seemed like it wasn't a valid career when especially compared with something as you know valid quote unquote as computer science and as programming but really what it takes is courage to be like no I am interested in this and it is valid and I don't know how it will be valid but I will figure it out because that's what I'm interested in and I think a lot of us already know what we're interested in deep down and we have to number one listen to it and say like yeah it's a it's a that's what I'm interested in that's not an accident that's that's who I am that's my passion and then number two uh, at the beginning, you're definitely not going to know how it's going to become a business. Definitely not. So you have to keep doing it. You have to keep doing it, doing it, doing it, and looking and being curious and making friends and participating in it and putting out there that you're interested in it. And one day things will start to come into play for you. But in the beginning, the first while, it's a, it's a total leap of faith. It's a total leap of faith and you do it because you love it. And that's what keeps you going until something materializes. So first of all, just know that you probably already know what you're interested in. You just might not be ready to hear it yet from yourself. I've known I'm interested in ballet since I was 17, but it took me till 27 to decide to listen to it. Um, and then in the beginning, you just, you don't know, you don't know where life's going to take you as long you, you put out your intention into the world and then you just hop on the ride. <laughs> you, you gotta, you gotta take the leap. I feel like that's just like a really nice sentiment to have. I, I think that um, it's just kind of interesting how like over time we kind of just like figure out these things. And I like how you mentioned um, how at first, um, how at first, like you knew, like, you know, when you started ballet, you, you knew that you're interested in it and it took like such a while. And I feel like for students, it's like they also might have like a passion and they just think, well, this isn't really practical. Or, yeah. yeah, like this isn't really practical. Um, but like you decided to just kind of choose what brought you joy and you focus on that. And I think that when you have that intention, um, it's like that's part of the reason why you are where you are today. Um, but also I just kind of wanted to ask, um, for for other again like for other entrepreneurs um if there's anything else you have to say to them in terms of just like starting their business um anything at all um yeah i think one of the most valuable things that um allowed me to start my business was that i was uh, very constrained by uh by money and that forced me to start small Okay. When I, when I was getting my first commercial lease, like when you're thinking about paying, so you already pay for your life. Right. And then you're thinking about paying for another business, another thing on top of it. And then for a dance studio, you have to buy flooring and mirrors and furnish it. So it adds up really quickly. Right. And I had some money fine, saved it up for my job, but I didn't have a ton of money. Like it wasn't like, you know, I didn't inherited a bunch of money or something. I had an amount that you would have saved from a bit of a professional career to take the risk on. And that forced me to sell a product that I was a little embarrassed about. And you should always start with a product that you're a little embarrassed about. If you get to the point that you're proud of it, you've waited too long to show it to somebody. And I think if I hadn't had that constraint, I would have made a huge cavernous studio that was 5,000 square feet and had this massive thing. And then you imagine now being in COVID with a 5,000 square foot, $10,000 a month lease, how much more of a pickle I would have been in because that's not where I was ready for. I wasn't ready for that big of an investment. You think about someone who's maybe building an app. If you wait five years to build the app, 
it's probably too late for the idea that you had because you saw the idea at the moment in time. So you have to get whatever it is out in front of people before, before you're ready. I was very lucky that money forced me to do it. But if you're just building it on nights and weekends and you're not actually paying any money to create your idea, it can be very easy to drag your feet and be like, well, I need this before I show it to people. And I need this before I show it to people. And this isn't perfect yet. And that's not perfect yet. But the only way you can make it perfect is by battle testing it. The, you will never make it perfect yourself. You need the feedback from the world to tell you how to shape it. So you have to put it, you have to put it out there. And if you're not lucky enough to be constrained by money, I know that seems weird to say that that's lucky, but I was very lucky to be constrained by money. Um, if you're not lucky enough to have that constraint in your idea, you have to put that restraint on yourself and show it to people ASAP, ASAP. I 100% agree. Um, I also just kind of think that having or not, not having, um, well, I, I'm trying to like phrase it the same way you did, but just kind of like having that constraint of money is all, also just like very, it pushes you because when you know that that's all you have to work with and also just like I've seen so many people who are who hardly kind of like have anything but they're so inventive and so imaginative because of that so I think that that is just like a very interesting sentiment that you had to um had to add along with like all of the other things that you mentioned earlier um and lastly I would kind of just like to ask you um I guess this is like an odd question but like, if you were in my shoes, what question would you ask yourself? Well, I think that in, it's funny because in your shoes, you don't know how, you wouldn't know yet how opportunities get created by someone in my position, right? Because you haven't been here yet. And I remember being there and thinking, hearing this sort of thing and being like, well, what do you mean if I just do something and put it out into world that opportunities will come my way? That makes no sense. What kind of opportunities are coming my way? You know, how, I guess the question is like, how would opportunities come my way, right? Um, and I think, having been on this side and having actually hired people and having created a team and having given people opportunities to think about how I've given opportunities and why I've given opportunities and why I've taken chances on certain people and why I've gone out of my way to help certain people get somewhere is because I could tell that they wanted something. The people who I can't tell that they want anything, I'm not interested in helping them out. I don't have time for just helping everybody out. I, I'm gonna help people out who have a passion and I can see want to get somewhere and that come with ideas and come with interest and have an idea for something. So like, as an example, if someone came to me and messaged me on Instagram, that's my main, that's the main way people find me these days is Instagram, as odd as that might sound. If someone came to you on Instagram and said, hey, can you give me some tips about marketing? I'd be like, I don't know, that's a huge, I'm not sure I have enough time to write you a bunch of tips about marketing. But if someone came to me and said, hey, I've been following you for a while and I see that you post every three days and you use this type of formatting and sometimes you post like this and sometimes that, and I have a lot of really great ideas for how you could do that better. Can I work with you on those things and give you my suggestions and we can work together on this. I'd be like, yes, great. Amazing. You've got something for me. I can tell you're super excited. You're on board with the mission. You're ready. This person loves marketing. They love graphic design. I will totally give them that opportunity. But someone who comes to me and is like, Hey, can you help me with marketing? I need to start something. It's like, well, show me some, show me some passion, right? Show me something that you really, really care about. Sink your teeth into it and don't be afraid to put yourself out there and show someone that you care about something. Cause ultimately that's when they'll give you an opportunity is when you say, Hey, I care about this thing. I really care about this thing. And then I'm like, great, amazing. Cause I do too. So let's partner up and care about this thing together. I think that's how opportunities get created, but you have to tell people what you care about. Yeah, I agree. I think that I mean, obviously, when you have passion for something, it just, it, it shows. And I think that when people can sense that it's like, it really kind of, kind of pulls them and guides them to want to either help you or collaborate with you. And also just like, you know, what you were saying about um, opportunities coming to you. It's also like, if you don't put anything out there, you're never really going to know. 
So I think that that's important to kind of remember and especially like for students who want to like do what you're doing, kind of tie all these things together and make like, you know, this really interesting idea or product or start this really interesting business. It's like they have to kind of just learn to be open and be unafraid and just kind of like put themselves out there. Um, so I agree with you hundred percent. And I'm also just like really happy that we got to have this conversation. Um, I found it very insightful and I know a lot of other students will feel the same way. Um, thank you so much for being a guest. I just hope that, um, I just hope that, or I obviously you like to help people because you know, of your business. So I just hope that you're, um, you also feel the same way about like, you know, this information that you're sharing, you know, that, you know, that it will help, um, other students who kind of want to start their own thing, but just like, they're not hundred percent sure of how. So again, thank you. Yeah. You're so welcome. What a great conversation, great questions. And, uh, yeah, hopefully whoever's out there listening will, have the, have the courage to be afraid and do it anyways. That is the key to entrepreneurship.